by loving one another. Our sisters and our brothers, we can show the world around us God is love. Let's go and tell the whole world God is love. It's great to see you in church today. We've got some young people from our Christian school going to sing for us in just a moment. Let's all sing together number 20. I'm standing on the solid rock. Sing it out. Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages safe from all the storms that scared of those people up there, all right? Y'all sing it out. Now, y'all, would you please smile? Standing on the rock, on the rock. It looked like you fought somebody on the way to church. If it was your wife, lean over and apologize. Honey, you were right. Let's just get it settled right now, all right? Come on now. Some of you won't even smile right now because that's what happened. And that, that was your opportunity. That was like God. Yes, it was. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So it's a happy song. Standing on the solid rock. Sing that second verse again. And then let's do a key change. Because key changes make me happy. All right? Let's go to key change and get a big ending All at the right, very end, All right, verse number Mike. two. Even go. though he's gone now, we'll key change for verse number three. Here we go. Even though. Even though he's gone now, I don't feel alone now. With comfort came the spirit of the Lord. Now with his word to God. you feel better, right? It's good. If you're glad you're in church today, say amen. 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 It's good to be in church. Pastor Clark's in Ohio, and he's preaching there. A church is dedicating their new building, and they asked him to come. Pastor Davis, his son Cole, is in the Bible college here. So Pastor flew out yesterday. Hadn't been feeling well, so appreciate people that pray for him. Texted me this morning, said he got a great night's sleep, feeling better today. So that's wonderful. We'll pray that God would help him this morning as he preaches and again this evening. We've been having our Spanish church revival. And Pastor Gil Torres has been in. He preached Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning. We've had great services there. 
and that's going on now, so we'll continue to pray for them, that God would bless them. Let's continue to pray for people going through uh, troubled times, deep waters. God would be with them. I spoke with Jocelyn Trell on the phone yesterday, and I want you to continue to pray for the Trell family. Uh, Stephen went home to be with the Lord a few weeks ago, and uh, she and her children are ones that we're praying for, and that God will give them the grace and help that they do need at this time. I believe it's not definite. There's been a lot of things they've had to work through here. But I believe that the funeral will be a week from tomorrow. It'll be the Monday evening service and a Tuesday burial there in uh, Powell, Tennessee. And so you pray, which is right near Knoxville, pray that God would help them and give them the grace that they need at this time. Pray for the Scully family. Uh, Brian's nephew uh, was killed tragically this past week. And some of you saw it in the news. It was side of 295 and an accident there. Uh, it, the uh, He was broken down, stepped out of the car, and was hit by somebody driving by. And so we need to pray for their family. There's a viewing today and service and tomorrow, and that God would be with them and help their families. It's just very, very difficult. And others in our church dealing with difficult things. We've got people dealing with serious illness, people dealing with cancer. Uh, let's pray that God would give everybody the grace that they need, okay? Good to see you here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As I pray here from the pulpit, would you please pray along with me in spirit, and we'll ask God to help us today. Father, we come into your presence through the power of prayer, asking that you forgive us of all of our sins. Lord, I pray you forgive us of uncleanness and pride, and Lord, just whatever all's there that shouldn't be there, we ask that you cleanse us, and Lord, we plead the power of the blood. We do worship you as our God. You're the solid rock and on which we stand. And Lord, you never change. You're faithful always. You're holy, holy, holy. Lord, you know all things and you're everywhere and you can do all things. And so, Lord, we worship you as God. We praise and thank you for so many blessings. Lord, thank you that we're not in the hospital today. Thank you that we could be in church today. Thank you for our freedom that we have living in this nation. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our faith. Lord, I do pray that you would be with the Spanish revival. I pray you'd help Pastor Torres. And I pray you'd fill him with the Holy Ghost. And I pray there'd be souls saved and lives changed. God, I pray you'd be with Pastor Clark. I pray you would put an anointing on his preaching this morning. I pray you bless the building dedication there. I pray it'd be a great day in the history of this church. And that you bless all of those dear folks. God, I pray... You be with the Trell family. I pray you give them supernatural grace. And I pray for the Scully family that you be with them. Pray for others in our church that are grieving and hurting in whatever variety of ways. Lord, I pray you bring a comfort to people's hearts today. Lord, I pray for the sick, that you give them the healing that they're praying for. God, I pray especially for those dealing with cancer and other things, that you strengthen them today. Lord, I pray that you'd help us here in this auditorium and throughout the building with our services. I pray you'd meet with us. I pray you'd stir our hearts. I pray you'd help all those singing, that you'd fill them with the Holy Ghost. I pray for those playing instruments, that you'd fill them with the Holy Ghost. God, I pray if there's anyone here or watching online that's not saved, I pray they'd get saved today. And for all of us who are saved, I pray we'd be stirred. I pray for our nation that we repent and we'd look to you and that you grant us revival. I pray, Lord, for Christians around the world. I pray for those in places where they're pressured or persecuted. I pray you give them special grace. Bless our missionaries and other missionaries around the world. Pray there be a great harvest of souls. We thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you help these young people now as they sing. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Brother Mike, give a word about our school, and then we're going to let them sing. Well, I appreciate Solid Rock Christian School. We actually started the school uh, just a few weeks before the church started. Back in 1981, we started in a little house with five students, and uh, I was one of the five. Thank God for that. And through the years, we've been able to have a Christian school, predominantly for our church. We've always run it, pastor, as a ministry of our church for our church young people to where they can come and get a godly education in a godly environment. And I thank the Lord we can meet and have Bible every day, have chapel once a week, and uh, educate our young people. And uh, thank God for that, that they can have a biblical worldview. And so we're thanking God for Christian education. I thank God for all of our teachers, and they're going to sing for us 
this morning. Thank you, young people. I appreciate that. Thank God we've got a God that can still move mountains, a God that is faithful, and you may be dismissed, right? Are you guys going at this time? You think they did a great hand, a good, a good job? Give them a hand. Thank you. Oh, how I love Jesus. 258. Stand with me, church. Let's sing it out. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. 258. There is. Yeah. 
can be seated if you're our guest here today. We're glad that you made it to our church service. I want you to get a blessing. Please make yourself at home. We like to give you what we call a response card. I ask you to fill that out. And when you leave, there'll be ushers at the back door. You can hand it off to one of the ushers. So if you're here today as a first-time guest or here just once in a while, would you raise your hand just high enough where the fellas could find you? They'll go through very quickly and give you one of these cards. And again, you could fill it out and hand it off to an usher when you leave. We would really appreciate that. And it is so glad, so good to have you here. I'm not sure how you heard about us, but I want the service to be a blessing to you. We're going to pray for our offering right now. And let's pray that God would uh, meet the needs of our church family and that God would help us here as a church day by day to be able to uh, go forward. We want to see God bless us. We want to get the gospel out both here and around the world. And it takes much expense here, much expense to, to run our church. And so uh, let's all be faithful to give. Father, I pray that you would bless the offering now. And I pray that you would use the money for your honor, for your glory. And I pray you bless each person who gives. And Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, to be a ministry that's spiritually prospering. And I pray, God, that you would finance your church. I pray for our people that are out of work or whose work is slow. You give them the right jobs. God, I pray you take care of our people. I pray for the business owners that you bless them. And uh, Lord, all of our people, part of the workforce, I pray you be with them and help them. Pray for people on fixed income, Lord, especially some of our elderly. I pray you be with them and get them through, take care of them. Lord, you've been so good to us, it's embarrassing. Lord, we are overwhelmingly and amazingly blessed. And we want to stop and thank you for that right now. And Lord, you're just too good to us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I pray you would bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you like to give, you can give online. If you don't know how to do that, you can register for online giving at solidrockinfo.org. Solidrockinfo.org. And if you'd like to give it to an usher as you leave, that's fine. Some folks bring it by the church during the week or mail it in. However you'd like to give, that'd be fine. All right, choir's going to sing. Here we go.
God for his faithfulness. Let's stand together. We're going to sing about the fact that Jesus is coming again. 125 in the book. One day the clouds will part and Jesus is coming again. Thank God for that. Let's sing about it. 125. Marvelous message we bring. Glorious carols we sing. Wonderful words. song. I appreciate the young people singing for us today. Choir singing for us today. And now we've got a group from the college singing for us. And um, God is good. They're going to sing about being thankful. And uh, this is our Thanksgiving week. We've got a lot to be thankful for. And can I say at the top of the list ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for what Jesus did for you and I. They'll sing. Brother Charlie will preach this morning. a place in the Bible called Heaven I know, and one thing's for sure, I'm ready to go, but I want to look on my sweet Savior's face and thank Him for saving me by His grace. Most of all, Jesus, he sits 
sits on his throne and there I can praise him like this all day long and thank you dear Jesus for saving my soul and thank you for loving me yes this I know and thank you for being my dearest friend and thank you for for saving my soul and thank you for loving me yes this i know and thank you for being my dearest friend and thank you for my place in heaven amen and thank you for Thank you, young people. Wonderful, wonderful song. Please turn to the Word of God to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 15 in your Bible. And I thank God for the music this morning, and it's been a blessing. I appreciate our Christian school. We have people in our church, Christian school, home school, public school. We've got it all. I appreciate our school here at Solid Rock as a ministry of our church. And uh, we have some other young people that are in their church this morning, but are also in our school, so that's not the whole crowd, but I'm glad for their heart for God, and I appreciate our teachers in the Christian school. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, and the nature of the book of Proverbs is subjects and kind of goes all over, and yet there are some general themes throughout the book, and one in particular, we'll be discussing here this morning, preaching about this morning from the book of Proverbs. And so uh, we are going to be in several different places in the book of Proverbs and a few spots out of the book of Proverbs. And I want you to follow along as best you can. If you're not used to turning to the scriptures, then if somebody near you has their Bible, don't be embarrassed if they share it. The goal is for everybody to be on the same Bible page and be able to look at the word of God. Some of you really love the book of Proverbs, and maybe you make it your habit, there's 31 chapters. Sometimes people choose to read a proverb a day corresponding with the day of the month. That's never a bad idea. It's a good one, and it's the wisdom book, and it's a great, great book in the Word of God. So we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 15. Let me have a prayer, and can I encourage you, you know, the devil hates it when we open up the Bible, and I want to encourage you to really pay close attention. Let me be blunt and direct. Can I stay off your phone? All right, stay off your phone. Open up your Bible. If I tell my kids in the nursery, they're going to be okay. We take good care of the kids in the nursery. I'm hungry. You're going to eat later. You're not going to starve. The economy may crash. If it does, you're not going to stop it. See, you're, you're making my blood pressure go. No, no, I'm trying to calm you down. We are here to learn God's word. And God has exalted his word above his name. So we want to show it proper respect. Does that make sense? We want to make sure we listen. And some of you are used to listening to preaching and been raised on preaching. Others, maybe it's the first time you ever heard the Bible preached. But the Bible is the word of God. And there's no book like the Bible. And the Bible can change our lives. And God wants to use his word to help our families, help our marriages, help our personal lives, help our church, help our nation. But we've got to give it close attention. And I just know how it is. The devil, he'll come and distract. People watch a ball game for two, three hours, hardly blink. And, just... and we come in and for a message from the Bible, and all of a sudden our mind just zooming all over the place. Why does that happen? Because the devil tries to attack us. So the Bible talks about bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So in the moment, let's just zone in as best we can. I didn't say zone out. Zone in on Scripture 
And if, if somebody next to you starts to snort, elbow them, all right? Don't let them do that. And somebody said, what do you, what, what do, you do if pe people go to sleep when the preacher is preaching? John Wesley said, you wake the preacher up. Well, all right? So I've got my work cut out for me here this morning. And make sure that we, again, give the Bible proper attention. Father, it's privilege to hold the Bible. Lord, we could be in a land where there's not a translation of Scripture. Uh, Lord, we could be holding a, a Koran or a Book of Mormon or some other teaching that doesn't agree with this book. God, we thank you that we have the King James Bible. And I pray, dear Lord God, that you would clear my mind, clear my spirit of anything that shouldn't be there. And Lord, I pray you'd empty me of self. I pray you'd hide me behind the cross. I pray you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost. And I pray, dear Lord God, that your words, as we read them and as they're spoken about, they'd impact our hearts. I pray you'd be with the three junior churches right now. I pray you'd be with Spanish church. I pray you'd be with Deaf church. Be with our younger kids class and nursery. And Lord, again, I pray for Pastor Clark as he's preaching. Lord, I pray you'd give him strength, and I pray you'd fill him with the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the privilege of opening up the Bible. We pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. I'm in Proverbs chapter 15, and we're going to go right to verse 33. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 33. And if you're there, would you read it together with me out loud? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 33. Ready? The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. I don't know how many of you mark your Bible. I mark mine often. And this is a verse that I definitely have underlined, and parts of it highlighted even more so. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Humility. So let's look at that first statement, the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is when we reverence God. The fear of the Lord is when we respect God. The fear of the Lord is when in our hearts we honor God. It's when we love God. It's when we have an actual fear in this sense. We know who he is and we don't want to step out of line because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I never enjoyed spankings as a kid. Brother Mike got very few. It wasn't because he didn't deserve them. It was because he was the youngest. And how many of you are like me, the firstborn, and you know we got more than the younger ones did? Come on. Yes, the truth. Now, the younger, no, we didn't. It. We were just better behaved. No. It, it, mom and dad got soft. Well. We're just we're stir the pot right now. Come on now, right? But my mother, she lit me up. She said, Brother Tolly, that's not... No, no, she did. She did. I was... Were you scared of your mother? Absolutely. Lean and mean. And she'd swing that paddle, and smoke alarms would go off, and... What, what, did she bruise you? Absolutely. If I had known the number for diapers, I would have called. Come on. Say, what was she doing? She was straightening me out. The Bible doesn't say whom the Lord hateth, he chasteneth. He said whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And when you fear the Lord, you understand, I don't want to mess with God. I reverence God. I, I respect God. I, there's an actual love in my heart in the sense of father-son, mother-son relationship, meaning I, I, with my parents, had a love, passionate love, love my mother, love my father, with all of my heart. And with God, I want to have a love with all of my heart. I know this, when he has to chasten me, it's not because he doesn't love me, it's because he does. So the fear of the Lord is something that ought to be in the heart of every Christian. Now it says here, if you notice in your book, verse 33, again, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. The instruction of wisdom. So when you look at that, and in your Bible, it, it's the idea, it's, it's that which leads us to wisdom. If 
I instruct somebody, all right, listen, this is the way you do it. This is how you get there. This is, I'm giving instruction. The fear of the Lord, when I reverence God and I respect God and I honor God and I love God and I submit to God and I have an actual fear, I don't want to mess with God. The fear of the Lord is what instructs me. It's what brings me to wisdom. Now, wisdom is the application of biblical principle. That's Pastor Clark's statement, and I like it. Wisdom is the application of biblical principle. It's not just in the knowing, it's in the doing. So wisdom is the application of biblical principle. Wisdom, I say it this way, it's finding out what the Word of God says to do and then doing it. Just because you know doesn't make you wise. Wisdom is in the application. Wisdom is in the doing. Very similar to the idea of what is spiritual success. Well, the word success is only found one time in the Bible. It's Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. And it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do, not just to know, but to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So wisdom and spiritual success ties in with when we fear the Lord and we recognize who God is and watch who we're not. Where we're not making about, why well, do what I want instead of what God says, but instead we fear the Lord and that brings us to a place of obedience to the word of God, which is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. If you will fear God and reverence God and respect God, I... I, I didn't plan to say this, but going back to what we said a few moments ago about the Word of God and our attention to it, people who fear God pay attention during preaching. I'm just being blunt with you. If you're checking the scores while we're preaching the Word of God, you're disrespecting God and His Word. Straight up. And, and so the idea would be, we, we understand who God is and who God's Word is, and that impacts our actions. Well, I fear God, not if you don't live according to Scripture. Not if we just do what we want instead of what God says. We only really fear God to the degree that we submit ourselves to Scripture and the Spirit of God. Spirit of God for the Christian moves in at salvation. You've got God living in you. Do you listen to Him? Do I listen to Him? Pastor Torres yesterday in the Spanish Revival, he preached yesterday morning about the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know Spanish, but Michael Rice was translating there for me. And there were some great things said about the fact that we have the Holy Spirit on the inside and the Spirit of God and the Scriptures, they go together and they're to work in the life of a Christian to bring us to wisdom and wisdom. And when you have it, the Bible says it is better than all the riches of the world. There's all kinds of people pursuing money, pursuing money, pursuing money. God says wisdom's better than all the riches and anything you could ever acquire with riches. It says it's the principal thing. That means it's the main thing. It's the chief thing. Now, you may not have become a millionaire, but you can have wisdom. Uh, you may not have become famous, but you can have wisdom. And wisdom is to be valued. And the fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. And it's the instruction of wisdom. And it brings us to this place of having wisdom. Now, why is that necessary? Why is that so important? Here's why. If you look at the rest of verse 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor, before honor is humility. Humility. Now, wisdom will bring you to a place of honor. However, honor is not like how the world typically honors. They'll figure out what it is that they want to crown. Okay, World Cup soccer. Everybody's going to, around the world, watch in order to win that little gold ball trophy thing. And, and nations and people, they'll do all that they do and they participate. We're going we're gonna to honor the, the greatest soccer and around the world football that, that, that's ever played and, and in this year. And, and we're going to give that. And it's this giant thing. And it's the most followed sport around the world. And say, wow, to, to honor. Okay. So people honor for what they choose to honor for. There's a difference between honoring where we make it about man and honoring where we make it about God. 
Now, it's not wrong to honor people. The Bible says give honor unto whom honor is due. But here's the thing. When you're giving honor to whom honor is due, that means they're the right type people, they're not going to absorb that honor for themselves. We're not, if we're the right Christian, going to make it about ourselves. The honor that we receive is not for the glory of you or the glory of me. It's for the glory of God. So we ought to fear the Lord, which translates into we're going to be following what he says, which means we're wise Christians. That means we're in the position, we're in the place where God can put honor on our lives so that we in turn give him the glory. So before honor is humility, because if we're not humble, we're going to get the honor and we're going to somehow think that we are the star of the show. We're not. The Bible says in Colossians 1.18 that in all things he might have the preeminence. It is only Christ who should be in the spotlight of our lives. It is only Christ who is worthy of glory and honor and praise. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's coming back again. We're talking about King Jesus. And we're talking about Jehovah God. I'm not God. You're not God. We're not worthy of glory. We're not worthy of honor. But thank God we serve a Savior who's worthy of glory and honor and power. Amen. Go to Revelation chapter 4 and pick up verse 10, would you please? Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. The four and twenty elders in heaven. What are they going to do? They're going to cast their crowns at the feet of God. Revelation chapter 4. Now, kept, I hope you kept your marker in Proverbs 15. I didn't tell you to do that, so forgive me, but make sure you do next time because we'll be back. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. Here's the 4 and 20 elders. Notice what they do. Fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Hey, listen, at the judgment seat of Christ, if any of us are able to receive reward and blessing and crown as Christian, I believe with all of my heart, when we see the Lord, hey, we're not going to be making it about us. We're going to want to have crowns to cast at his feet because he alone is worthy of praise. Now look in verse 11. Here's your purpose. You ever wonder what your purpose is? Revelation 4.11, thou art worthy. Now, thou is not speaking to me or you. That's speaking to God. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive what? Glory, help me church, and honor. Do you see that? Glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Now, if you're really thinking and you're with me, how many of you would definitely agree he's created all things? All things includes us. Does that make you agree with that statement? Thou hast created all things. Why? And for thy pleasure... They are and were created. So we're not made for our own selves, for our own persons. We're made for the glory and honor of God. And when you will fear the Lord and have the right spirit, which will result in the right actions, it will bring you to a place of wisdom, God can be blessing you in your life because wise people are humble people. And God will be able to put honor on your life. And what I mean by that is God's going to be able to put his hand on your life, put his touch on your life, put his blessing on your life, put his anointing on your life, put his prospering on your life so that your life is influential for the glory of God. For the glory of God. And for that to happen, humility is necessary. It is necessary that you and I would have a humble spirit. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be used by God. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1, if you're back at Proverbs, if not, flip back there quickly, please. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1 talks about desire. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1, through desire, a man or woman, having separated himself, separated herself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. We're back on that wisdom thing. It's through desire somebody says, listen, I want to disconnect from the things that God wants me to disconnect from. I don't want to in my spirit not fear God. 
So I'm going to consecrate myself unto God, and I've got a desire in my heart to be knowing God's will and God's plan and God's word, and I want to stay focused on the things of God, and I want that wisdom that God says is so important, and it's a strong burning desire in my heart because I want God to use my life. Every person here ought to want to have God using your life for his honor and glory. And if you're not having your life used by God for his honor and glory, then you are wasting your life and you're not fulfilling the purpose for which God put you on planet Earth. And that's reality. So there's nothing wrong with having the right type of spiritual desire to be your best that you can be for God. But again, reiterating, it's not so we then can be recognized so that we can be someone who's excessively praised or so that we can build our own kingdom to the glory of Clark. It's not about my glory. It's not about your glory. It's about God getting glory and honor. And if we're not careful, pride will keep us from having the humility that's necessary in order to be honored. Pride is so subtle. If you look at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 12, notice this. Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Haughty. Brother Charlie, what does haughty mean? It's the idea to soar. To be raised up, lofty, high, exalted, haughty. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Watch. We think we're somebody. We're, we're, we're soaring, we think. We're, we're, we're even sometimes better than others. Higher than others. We're, we're up here in our mind. We, we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. God said before destruction. Mm, what's that destruction? Hey, that's when God takes you from the highest heights you think you're at and puts you in the lowest lows. You ever heard of the word ruins? And you think about ancient cultures. All roads led to Rome. You remember that. We were just in Israel and at the time of Christ, Rome there and all that it had in its power, and, and I've been there, and I've seen the Colosseum, and, and, and you think about all of what's going on there, and in Rome, and oh, Rome was the ultimate. Was. You know, people's homes, lives, families can be destroyed because God brings a judgment because of haughtiness. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, haughty. But notice the rest of the verse, verse 12, 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor, and before honor is humility. So you are reading that right, exact words, as Proverbs 15, 33. Would you mark it again, if you're really good with your Bible? Here in 18, you're writing 15, 33, next to verse 12. And you've already flipped back to 1533 and wrote 1812. You got that? The war of. No, the verse of. So here's the thought. Before honor is humility. God's repeating this. It must be important. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. That means this. Listen, God's not going to share his glory with another. And if you happen to be honored by man and take it for yourself... God's going to bring you down to destruction. You remember King Herod in Acts chapter 12? Boy, he had been he killed James. He locked up Peter. He thought he was the man. He was there at Caesarea. We were just there. 
and you get there right on the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful place, sun shining, he's out in public, there's an amphitheater there, could have been the one, it was at that time there, and he could have been speaking right there. Church history says he was arrayed in an outfit all silver, and there in that sun by the sea, he was glowing, and the Bible says he gave an oration, but here was the problem, he didn't give God the glory. The Bible says that the worms consumed him. The worms ate him up right there in front of the crowd as Herod was brought down because of his haughty spirit. You know, if you fear the Lord, you don't want to experience that. I mean, if you're reverencing and respecting God, you don't want, you don't want to get to that point of having a haughty spirit. Look in the book of Ezekiel. People think, Brother Charlie, Sodom. Well, I tell you what, Sodom was a horrible place and all the Sodomites and all that went on there, and it was, no doubt. But if you look in Ezekiel chapter 16, you'll see what God says is the reason Sodom was destroyed. And it's quite surprising in, in our spirit. We probably want to be argumentative a little bit, but that wouldn't make sense to argue with God. So, oh, well, man, I'll tell you what, that story, and they were scratching at the door, chasing those angels, and how disgusting is that? Yes, and agreed. But look at Acts, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. First thing listed, notice, pride. Pride. Wait, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Those bad behaviors, listen, they weren't the root. They were the symptom. In Sodom, listen, the bad behaviors... They weren't the root, they were the symptom. You say, Brother Charlie, what was the root? Pride. Pride. Listen, every, every sinful behavior has its root in pride. I had a Bible college teacher, and he would say that over and over and over, every sin has its root in pride. And I would try to then think through about different sins and say, yeah, ultimately that's right. Here's why. Because every sin is disobedience to what we know to be true from God's word. And if we're willing to disobey what God says, the root of disobedience is pride. And all of the rot in Sodom tied in with disobedience to the scriptures because of a lack of fear of God. And please hear me this morning. The reason why America is fast-tracking towards hell is not just because of all the sinful behaviors. They are indicating what is really the root problem, which is a lack of fear of God because of our arrogant spirit in this country where we think we can ignore God, ignore God's word. God help us even in supposed Christianity. It's been so Laodicean and lukewarm. We've lost the anointing. We've lost the touch. We've lost the blessing because we think that we're good, great, and wonderful. And God says, you don't see. You're poor and blind and naked. And we're never, we're never going to have the honor, the blessing on this nation that comes from God when we think we're so wonderful and we've made ourselves gods. Well, look what they're doing in government. Yeah, look what they're doing. Murdering babies this week took another step to legalize sodomite marriage and any other type of whatever persons want to get together. They're trying to take steps to make that to where it's not going to be changed ever, including by the Supreme Court and all this garbage that's going on and pushing it through. And ultimately, it's going to be causing pressure and persecution towards Christians. For anybody who's following what I'm saying on all that. So, by the time, why do they behave like that? Because they don't fear God and they're full of pride. Yeah, that's why we need a change. And, you know, what about, and, you know, and if he runs and if that. You know what? Let me just go on record, okay? And this is going to ruffle some of your feathers. I don't care if it's DRR. When people set themselves up and speak like Nebuchadnezzar and speak like Herod and speak like they are the greatest thing that ever existed with an obvious narcissism that is deep-rooted, including of its treatments of other people. Yeah, I'm glad for whatever was or whatever may someday be positive, but I believe it's the judgment of God on America that our leaders do not bend the knee in fear and instead lift themselves up as gods. 
I don't worship man. And we're in a sickening spot where we look towards the White House thinking that's going to save America and not realize that the problem is in the church house where God's people need to get back on our faces and humbly seek our God. There is no other solution. If you're looking anywhere other than in the mirror for becoming the Christian that God can honor and bless as salt and light and difference makers, if you're looking anywhere else, you're looking in the wrong place. The only way for America to ever become great again is for God's people to fear God again. And for the people of this nation to fear God again. There's no politician going to ride in and save this thing. Are you kidding me? When are we going to wake up? We don't fear God. We live without wisdom. We do what we want. People throwing token Christianity in the direction of God. Yeah, I'll show up once in a while Sunday morning. God, I hope you're good with it. I'm doing you a favor by being here. Where's the commitment to Christ? Where is our daily walking with God? Brother Charlie, how do I know if I'm humble or not? Well, tell me about your dependence on God. You say, what do you mean by dependence on God? Well, humility is being dependent on God. And you can gauge your dependence on God by your submission to God and your walk with God. I'm not humble if I don't read my Bible. Because by going into my day not reading my Bible, what I'm saying is I can do it without your word. Now, I never look up, shake my fist at God, but my behaviors say I don't really need God when I don't read my Bible. I'm indicating I really don't think I need God if I don't start my day on my knees. Are we submitting? to Scripture, to the Spirit? Are we acknowledging, God, I don't want to do this without you? See, listen, Christians who are careful about the fear of the Lord, they're, they're watching. All right, am I really following what God wants? Am I really, listen, you made a good call today. You came to church. That was the right move. Yeah, we debated. No, listen, there's no debate. You made the right move. You got here. Well, but I got this going on in my life, and I don't feel the greatest about my Christian life right now, and man, I should be better right with the Lord, and blah, 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 blah. I understand that. But listen, one step at a time, as we are sensitive to the Spirit of God, God will work in our hearts. God will work in our lives. Some of you have been through a season of discouragement. Some of you two, three, four, five years now, and you're not near what you used to be as a Christian, but you got babies at the house that call you dad or call you mom. Let me tell you, my brother, stay in the church. Well, our marriage is on the rocks. God can deliver your marriage. God can save your marriage. But Charlie, I'm depressed like you don't know. Like I've thought about just checking out on the whole thing. You're not a failure until you quit. And quitting is not an option. When God wants to take you, that's fine. But you don't make that choice yourself. You just go ahead and get in the saddle again spiritually and say, I'm going to depend on God. So humility. Well, the wheels fell off. Well, yeah, sometimes God allows that. You say, why? So we grow dependent. Because God resisteth the proud. You ever had a little kid swing at you and you hold them back and they're doing this here and they're trying, right? What you do? You're resisting them. I don't want God holding me at arm's length. I don't want God saying, no, I can't trust you. You're going to make it about you. I don't trust my flesh. I'm sorry. I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust me. You say, what do you mean? Because pride is so subtle. We, we camouflage pride. Sure we do. Pastor Clark gets up in the tree to hunt. I know some of you just cringe right there, but he does. And when he does, he wears camouflage. You know why? He doesn't want to be seen. So he's up there camouflaged. And you know what we do sometimes? We camouflage our pride. Come on. Y'all looking real spiritual. You're doing some camouflaging right now. Like, Brother Ty, don't look at me like that. No, listen, come on. You know how it is. Man, we've got some 
internal self-applause going on. Listen, God made you to be for his glory. And there's times when God uses you. And when he does, can I encourage us? Let's give him the glory because he's the only one that's worthy of it. Give God the glory for your story. You're saved. You're not going to hell. You weren't so smart that you figured it out. That's called amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I'm the wretch in the song and so are you. Thank God for grace. Thank God you're on a church pew instead of a bar stool. Come on now. That's the truth. Thank God for his grace. But we need to be humble. Real humble. You say, why? Because God hates pride. I don't even like reading these verses, but can we just go quickly through a few verses in Proverbs? I want you to see with your eyes, Proverbs chapter 15. Let, let's just prove biblically God hates pride. Proverbs chapter 15. I want you to pick up verse 25, please. Proverbs 15, 25. Here's what the Bible says. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Man, I don't want to be that guy. But he will establish the border of the widow. Think of a widow. You think of just a simple lady with a simple lifestyle. And God says, I'll establish her border. But the person that thinks they're all that in a bag of chips, whatever that means, I'm going to destroy them. Look at 16.5. Everyone that is proud in where? Heart. Help me. Everyone that is proud in where? Heart is an abomination to the Lord. You know that's the strongest word in your King James Bible to describe what God hates? It's an abomination. Though hand join in hand. It's the idea of though they're in a league. Though, though, though they would hold hands. Kind of you see people marching, demonstrating at times and let's go together. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. It doesn't matter how much the world assembles themselves against the things of God. They're going to lose. And we don't want to be proud in heart. Look at chapter 21. <clears throat> chapter 21 and verse 4. And high look. So it can just be a look. Because you remember in Proverbs 6 and verse 16 and 17, the Bible says these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Verse 17 of chapter 6 here in your book says a proud look. And here we see an high look, a proud look, and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked, the Bible says, is sin. Is sin. Wow. Brother Ty, what, what could we be proud about? I don't know. Fill in the blank. You all help me. What are some of the things we might be tempted to be proud about in our hearts and lives? I didn't say you are, but what would be some things you'd be tempted to be proud about? Success. Success. Okay, now, success can be measured in a lot of different ways, right? Success can be me measured in a lot of different ways. One way we could be tempted to be proud because of success would be in the area of having something or what? Yes, talent. Okay, so success or talent, you're good at what you do. Well, thank God for that. It, nothing wrong with talent. God gave us talents and gifts and abilities. But the whole point is we're not supposed to be using it so that we become high-minded and walk around with a proud look like we're something. So sometimes our forms of success or our talent, say, what do you mean by that? Oh, it could, it could just be that you're good in sports. I, I, I thank God that I get to pick people on my team who are good in sports. All right? I, I, love, I love to have that. It's always good. I'm not good at them. I play, but I, I like to pick people good at sports. Well, that's great if they use it for their glory. The American sports team, it, it, it's sickening. It, it's literally, it's sickening. I didn't say everybody, the play, but I mean, in general, it's, it's, it's all about, it's, it's all about, it's, it's all about. Look, if you, can, if you can walk and kick a ball or throw a ball or hit a ball or whatever, you ought to give God the glory. Right? So talents, somebody up here singing. Man, thank the Lord for the good singing. Maybe you're good looking. So, oh, Brother Charlie, that's me. All right, good. I found, I found, I found your gift. 
you know, well, people tell me I have pretty eyes or whatever it is you've been told your whole life. Wonderful. You know, I'm glad. But let me ask you a question. Who, who, who made you? And who would you be without your makeup? No, anyway. <laughs> who made you? What are we? Because the world may view us as handsome or pretty, and, and we think somehow we're special. Come on. You got money? Good for you. Praise the Lord. If God blessed you financially, nothing wrong with that. But you're no better because you have money. God's not a respecter of persons. People get a little bit of money, walk around starting to think, you know, everybody ought to just, you know, when they snap, people ought to just jump. Well, where'd you ever get that idea? If God blessed you with money, you're supposed to give him the glory for it. You're supposed to steward it for his glory. Well, I'm smart. I'm the person who always can answer the question. I'm glad for you. I love people. Pastor Clark, he's ridiculously smart. His mind's like a steel trap. It's just like there and forever. And, and I don't, God did not gift me with that mind, <laughs> obviously. But here's the thought, right? I, I love smart people, but it's only if it's for the glory of God. I said this in our class in here this morning, but Pastor Clark says this. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm a Bible student. Now, if you know anything about what a scholar is, I, I'd put him in that category. But he doesn't. And that's why God shows him things. You say, why? It's his approach. It's his approach. He's not here, so we'll talk about him some more. Pastor Clark. <laughs> Pastor Clark, he walks out here on Thursday. He's coming down the hallway. And he's shutting off lights. I say, you don't have to do that. We've got people assigned to that. Now, they leave lights on in the bathroom. They leave the door unlocked. I check it. I make sure. He, he, Pastor Clark turns the lights off here. Pastor Clark gets the mail out of the mailbox. You've heard him say, I've been waiting 40 years for that big check, and I'm going to be there when it comes, right? <laughs> and it doesn't. It doesn't. But Pastor Clark, he goes out in the mail. He'll sort the mail. You say, why? He wants to do it. He'll, tra he'll carry trash in a heartbeat. Amen. In a heartbeat. You say, why? Because he doesn't put, there's no fancy pastor's parking spot, or for that matter, Mrs. Clark, no princess parking spot. You know what it is? They just roll in here, they do what they do, to the glory of God. Amen. And can I go on record? None of us are Christian celebrities. <laughs> including in this local church. Everybody all right here? I, I should have told you to put your seatbelt on this morning, right? We're going for a ride. Hey, <laughs> nobody should be peacocking around here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Here I come, time for church again. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. I am a worm. Come on, yeah. get real. I'm a worm. I ought to burn in hell. I'm not going there. It's because of Jesus. It's because of the Lord. Tell the person next to you, say, you're a worm. Who's been saved? Now, if you're next to your wife and you just did that, you're really dumb. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to shout with the mic off. <laughs> there we go. So God will judge the pride, but here's hope, ready? God will bless the humility. And humility is a possibility. Humility is a possibility in your life, in my life. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. Yeah, pop that for the screen. Let me know when it's there. Just pop it up at any time. Proverbs chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 2. You there? Talk to me out loud. Ready? When pride cometh, but with the, with the lowly is wisdom. Now, does lowly mean you have to walk around with a bag over top of your head? No. It's talking about your spirit. It's your spirit. It's the idea of lowly, think with me, is the opposite of highly. Remember, what's the haughty? That's when it's high up. That's when, that's when you're saying, you know what lowly is? Is when you recognize who you are. Paul said, I am what I am 
by the grace of God. And when you have a humble spirit, God can use your gift set and your life for the glory and honor of God. Go quickly to chapter 28, please. Chapter 28 and verse 25. Chapter 28, verse 25. You're doing great. It's 1145. I said, why'd you tell me that? Because I'm watching the clock just so you don't have to. All right? Proverbs chapter 11. And if you're a guest, there is no trap door that they push the button. Brother Mike sent me this pic mid-message, and I just looked at it while preaching, and look at that. Yeah, come on. There's a spirit. There's a spirit where if your shoe's untied, he'll see it. And here, get, 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 over, probably say, get over here, right? <laughs> Why are you walking around with your shoes untied? Somebody's tying shoes. I said, Brother Charlie, what is that? That's a servant's heart. Come on. Hey, Brother Charlie, you're belaboring that. Yeah, because he's not here. Well, Brother Charlie, what made Solid Rock Baptist Church? God did. God's word did. There's a God's word in the Bible, in, in, the, in the window, on the pulpit, in every pew. And a pastor who wants to fear the Lord, to live wisely, so that God can put some honor in their humility, so that God gets glory from our story. That's possible for you. That's possible for your family. That's possible for all you've got going on. It's a choice. It's a choice. Look with me, if you would, please. Uh, forget which one I told you. 28, 25, are you there? He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. Let me ask you a question. You always fight with people. You always fight with people. Well, I'll tell you what, about the type of work I do, you have to understand, it's a jungle out there. And we just go out there and we just, we got, man, it is cutthroat. You got to see, you've never been on the job. One, I have been on the job, so I do know, including how the heathen act. But you know you ain't heathen? Well, they just swallow me up. No, you can walk in the spirit. No, 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 come on. He's of a proud heart. Listen, we, we, we don't need to be stirring up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. You say, Brother Charlie, what's that? That must be my life verse. No, I didn't say that. You did. But here's the point, right? It's the idea of an abundance of blessing. It's an abundance of blessing. He that putteth his trust in the Lord. See, if you trust you, you're in trouble. But if you trust the Lord, you're in good hands. Look in chapter 29. 29, 23. My God have mercy on all of us. 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low. But honor shall uphold the humble, where church? In spirit. Listen to me. Can I encourage you, especially the men here? Because I believe with all of my heart we struggle with pride more than the ladies do. My dear brother, can I encourage you? If you've got family, you got a wife, you got kids. Don't dig in with disobedience. Don't, don't, don't dig in. It's just where I'm at right now. Here's what you need to do make a choice. What's the choice, Brother Charlie? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Brother Charlie, what does lift you up? It means. He can honor you. He could bless your family. He could bless your life. Yeah, but you don't understand. This happened and I'm upset with God. I can't be any more direct. You got to get over it. Well, I didn't think it was going to be this way. And this happened. And that was unexpected. And that is really hard. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. I didn't say all things are good, but all things work together for good. And maybe you hit something along the way that just knocked you out of the saddle. And maybe you've been struggling in your spirit between you and God and you're almost in a fixed position of disobedience. Listen, you've got too much to lose to stay in that place. Rather than God having to let the wheels fall off, why not make the choice, humble yourselves. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he'll lift us up. 
Look in Proverbs 25. Please, thank you. Proverbs 25, 27. It is not good to eat much honey. Honey's good, greatest natural food you can eat, but you don't want to eat the whole bottle. So, for men to search their own glory is not glory. You know, the idea would be this. Don't spend too much time reading your own press clippings, your own, your own headline banners. Don't spend too much time thinking about what your stats were in the book. I've had young men, and Brother Keith's back there, our basketball coach. If we see it happening, we'll smack them and steal the book away. But the last whistle's barely been blown for the end of the game, and they're running over to check the book with the scorekeeper. How many points did I have? How many rebounds I have? Now, I won't tell you what we've done to kids that have done that after we've lost the game, okay? We've lost some students through the years, right? Are you kidding me? We lost the game, but you're checking your stat sheet. Come on now, adjust your halos. Y'all looking super spiritual today. Let me just tell you something. Man, just checking out, you know how it is. God uses our gifts, our talents, our abilities in some way. He found us in a humble state and he put a little honor on us and all of a sudden we forgot where it came from and we go and we try to flaunt ourselves out there like we're something when we're nothing. We're nothing. And we've got to be careful. How do you humble yourself? Well, there's no book like the Bible. When you wake up each day, say, I need the book. There's something about starting your day in the pages of God's word that can bring about a humility in your day, in your person, in your spirit, like nothing else can. Read your Bible. Soak in the scriptures. It'll help to bring about the humility. If physically able, watch. Bend the knee. Why do we kneel? Why, why do we have an old-fashioned altar where we say, hey, if you can, if physically able, come and kneel here. And why, why would you at your home, in your own prayer closet, or whatever place, getting on your knees? Why? It's a, it's a humility before God. And here's what prayer does. It indicates, God, I need you. David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. I don't have time to belabor it. I teach prayer and fasting class in the college each fall to the core students, our freshman students. And David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. Fasting is not eating for the purpose of emphasizing prayer. Just like you'd mark your Bible, it's marking your prayer. It doesn't make God do anything. You can't corner God. But it's a weakening. You know what fasting does? It brings about a weakening. How about I don't like being weak. I don't feel good when I fast. That's the purpose. But watch. God designed it, and there's something spiritual about it. Now, unsaved people can fast for health purposes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But, you know, Christian people, Jesus said when he cast out that devil, intense spiritual warfare that was in that void, he said, these things cometh not forth. I'm talking about those type devils are not coming out of a void. These things cometh not forth, but by prayer and fasting. And here's what you're going to find. Fasting can humble you at a greater level than almost anything. Brother Ty, why would I be hum humbled so you can... Have God put some honor on you and you not take the glory? I already mentioned, and I'm not going to hide it, I'll restate. I, I don't trust me. Now, I have the Holy Spirit on the inside. I have Brother Mike, the Holy Spirit on the outside. And I, and I mean that, and, and, I, and I ask him to be that and in my life. If I, if I say something I shouldn't say, he very quickly doesn't even let me finish the message. He'll, he'll, it's text is rolling in. 
Sometimes emails, I mean, long, lengthy emails, mid-message, they just come rolling in. And, and, I, and he, he didn't ask for that calling on his life, but God knew I needed the Holy Spirit on the inside and on the outside. And I don't mind it. And sometimes, listen, I'll be recounting something, I'll be telling something, and I'll, I'll insert me in. And sometimes on the outside, he'll say, oh, you did. Shut up. No, I don't. But I think it, but I, listen, here's, here's what I want. I want to take it. Because listen, I don't want, I don't want when I have a wife and, and, and three daughters and two sons-in-law and a grandson and a grandbaby girl on the way, God willing, and, and, and young people and people that I get to preach to and teach to and talk to and the people whose doors I was knocking on yesterday when we were out witnessing and trying to talk to people about the Lord and wherever God would send me to be able to just maybe put Pastor Clark style tie somebody's shoes. I, I don't want to be that God doesn't give me those opportunities. I don't want God to set me on the shelf and say, no, it's too much about you. And I don't want when God puts me in a spotlight at times, sometimes it just feeling that way. I'm like, God, Lord, don't, don't let me get in the way. I took a phone call from Dr. Clarence Sexton. He's a preacher in Tennessee, this past week. He said, Jocelyn wants to speak, wants you to speak at Stephen's funeral. And boy, that humbled me. I don't trust me. I thought about that. Oh, God, his life was all about you. I don't want to go down there and stand up and insert me in the picture. Oh, I can testify and maybe give some personal stories because I got to be his youth pastor. I was privileged to be his youth pastor. I was graced to be his youth pastor. I talked to her yesterday. She mentioned about speaking. She said Stephen had that in his plans. I said he planned his funeral. She said yeah. He had his funeral planned because of where he worked. And he asked for you to be one of the people to speak. Boy, that humbled me. Who am I? Nobody. Nothing. I don't ever say something like this. No big deal. Wednesday and a Thursday. I just thought, I'm not, I'm not eating today <laughs> for, for these 23, 24 hours. Uh, I'm, I'm not. You say, why? Because I, I, don't, I don't want. Please hear me. I don't want for anybody to think, Clark had anything to do with whatever Stephen Trell's spiritual successes were. Brother Mike would feel the same way. Listen, he, meaning he's someone to influence and people in this room to influence. Here's my point. Here's my point. Everybody here. We done the message. Everybody with me still. And forgive me for such personal testimony. Because the Bible said if you fast to be recognized, that that's the reward you get. And I've never met the praise I could get for fasting that was worth me skipping food. So I don't, I don't like to personally testify. My point is to show you not my strength, but to show you I don't trust me to the point of I just said, you know what, God, you do in my heart what needs to be done. Let me just say what I should say so that you get the glory. And there's other things I'm praying for, that when you pray and fast, it's like, God, I, I can't move. You, you fast to affect something spiritually. I'm talking about a warfare issue. I'm talking about a person you want to see saved. I'm talking about somebody that's struggling that you care about. And you say, you know what, God, I, I, Lord, I, I can't do it. And I don't have strength, but you do. And I don't, Lord, if I'm holding back the power, God, clear me out. It's a spirit. It's an attitude. It's us acknowledging who he is and who we're not. And he can't. Share his glory with another. He's not going to do it. Pastor preached one time about photobombing God. Where he's to be the one that we all look at and think how beautiful. And there we go and we try to put ourselves in the picture. How foolish. How I messed that picture up. So when you pray and you fast and you walk with God. 
And you give God the glory. Brother Chad, what do you mean give God the glory? I'm talking about every time somebody says something to you that's positive about who you are, you have one good, solid response. Praise the Lord. Yes. Brother Chad, boy, that, that message helped me. Praise the Lord. Boy, I tell you what, man, that song, Brother Mike, you were singing, God touched me. Praise the Lord. Man, I tell you what, you're an usher and you're at that door every week and I appreciate your faithfulness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on. I'm motivated about this subject. You say, why? Because I want God to breathe on our church. I, I want God to fill this place. I, I want God to take your family and make it for the glory of God. You young people that are here in this room, you have so much potential, it's mind-boggling to me. If, 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 you can be humble. I don't know how many times I've sat with people in our church, men in our church, People in ministry, ladies included, and said, pertaining to ministry plans, if we could be humble, God could do something. If we could be humble, God could do something. If we could get lower, he could show himself stronger. If we could get lower, he could show himself higher. Don't you all want, when people drive down that white horse pike, to think there's a place where God dwells? There, there, there's a family where whew, something different about that crowd. Yeah, it's because of my masterful parenting skills. How about it's the grace of God? <laughs> Come on, if you're upright, if you're upright for the Lord, it's all because of him. Father, forgive me for my stinking pride. Lord, it must be a stench in your nostrils. And I pray, dear Lord God, you forgive me, forgive us. Let's stand, altars open if you want to pray. Maybe it's been a while. If you're physically able, you want to bend the knee, it'd be a good idea for me, for you, for all of us. I know I'm being a little bit raw up here. I hope you know it's not to put on a performance. It's from my heart. I, I want God to work here. I don't want to get in the way. I don't want you to get in the way of how God wants to work in your family. Spirit of humility. Let's fear God. Maybe you just know there's some areas you've been stubborn. You and God. Maybe you didn't shake your fist at him, but you've been stubborn. By not doing what he said or by doing what he said, don't do. How about submit right now to his spirit, to the scripture. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've not been fearing you the way I used to. Why don't you pray for that wisdom? God, help me. Not just to know what I know, but do what I should. Pray for that wisdom. Ask God to put in you a spirit of humility. To where he could prosper you, bless you, honor you. And you give him all the glory. You've been mad or bitter at God. Why don't you just lay that on the altar right now? Lay it on the altar. Life's hard. It's hard. And we can get sidetracked. Don't get bitter. It's not wrong to ask why. It's wrong to get bitter. If you're not a Christian, we have many ladies standing here that could take a Bible and show you how to get saved. That's the Bible word, saved. Saved from sin. Saved from hell. Jesus saves. We all deserve hell. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. It's what I deserve. Christ died for my sins and Christ died for your sins. You don't get to heaven by joining this church, getting baptized, putting money in an offering plate. You've got to put your faith and trust in Christ. Would you humble yourself to come and be saved right now? If you're a lady that needs Christ, why don't you step out from where you're at? Now, I could never walk down there. You could. If you humble yourself. If you're a man, you're not saved. Would you walk down here right now? And if you're not saved, come to Joe right here in the middle. He'll take his Bible and show you from the Bible how you could be saved. We men, I really do believe, struggle with pride even more than the ladies do. And if you're not saved and you're a man, I don't care how much you've been coming to this church or how long you've been coming here, you ought to step out right now and get saved. If you're a lady, come to one of these ladies, privately and off to the side. They'll take their Bible and show you from the Bible how you could be saved. Show you from the Bible how you can be saved.
greatest decision you could ever make would be to come to Christ. Well, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to fix some things first. No, no, no. You just come to God just as I am, and he'll change your life. He'll change your life.